Welcome, everybody, to Wednesday's Live. Um, it's so nice to have you jump in and watch. Um, today, I'm going to use this lovely photo that my cousin provided. It's a uh, lake somewhere in, uh, I believe, northwest Washington. But it's a wonderful uh, workout to address the subject contrast, which is in watercolor, almost our most important thing to work with in terms of the subject. Watercolor is, it's, it's not an authoritarian medium where you get to just judge every value and judge every uh, edge and, and, and finagle it until you get it exactly where you want it. It's a little more democratic. It's going to be doing its own thing. So we have to f use places you use contrast in places uh, to kind of, what, in other words, just use what we have rather than use what we don't have. So um, the big thing is to do it in all the properties. We have this limited vocabulary in, in painting. We have big and small, so there's a contrast. We have uh, size, different sizes. Uh, I mean, that's the same thing, isn't it? We have different positions. We have, you know, we can vary the positions of things, and we can vary the shapes of things. There are organic shapes. There are geometric shapes. There are sharp shapes. There are round shapes. Um, then within color, we have... Complementary colors, that's a kind of contrast. We have value. That's probably our biggest contrast thing. Dark and light. Watercolor really wants that. Um, and then saturation or vividness or chroma. We have uh, dull colors. We have contrast them with vivid colors. Um, we have texture. Uh, this kind of texture very busy, this smooth, wonderful kind of texture. Um, that's a contrast. Uh, we have opacity and transparency. We can have the color kind of let something underneath show through, or we can make a very strong, uh, opaque mark. So those are the things we can work with. Um, the big trick is to make sure that you have contrast in your contrast. I know that sounds stupid. Contrast of proportion. In other words, not equal amounts of large and small shapes, more big shapes than little shapes, uh, more organic shapes than geometric shapes, uh, more dark values than light values, or vice versa. Any of those things will work. And so contrast of proportion in all your elements. So, well, we also have space. We have, we can contrast what's happening in the back versus what's happening in the front. And maybe the best way to do it is just kind of talk you through or to do what I do when I talk myself through an image when I'm uh, planning it and painting it. Hello, Alan. Um, I've got probably... I'd say overall a little more light than dark, but I could swamp that the other way. Uh, I've got lots of uh, probably more smooth shapes in the sky and the water than I do raggedy shapes uh, in the um, grasses and trees and things. I've got more cool colors, I think, bluish purples, those sorts of things, than I do warm colors like the orangey yellow ochre colors here. Um, and I would say not much in the way of vividness, but I'm going to have to figure out ways. If you can't contrast something one way, then you're going to have to find another way to contrast it. So let's say I've got, uh, very textured shapes in the back, such as that, and I've got very textured shapes in the front. Well, I could make this one bluer and lighter, and I could make this one darker and a little more umber. So there's some contrast, even though there's similarities. Um, 
Mm, things like that. And maybe the most important thing, in, uh, and this would apply to other mediums as well, contrast in the level of rendering. In other words, things that are closer to us or are perhaps more important as subject matter those we would render a little more carefully and the other things that are around it and it's particularly further away, those we're going to render a little bit less specifically because it's, it's kind of a, uh, a beginner fault. Uh, actually, it's a fault. With, I have the fault too. So I'll just keep looking around and finding stuff and, oh, I can paint this and, oh, and I can paint. Oh, look at that back there. And, uh, Pretty soon, the whole thing is getting a little too over-rendered, over-busy, and I'm losing my sense of space. So I'm going to talk you through exactly what I want to do with this picture. I've got darks on top of lights, so I'm going to put in a wash of a bluish, violetish gray. I'm going to switch to a more ochre orange color, switch back to a blue gray, but I'm going to put a little more blue in it so that the blue grays in the front are a bit more vivid than the blue grays in the, that are farther away. Um, I might add in, because all these edges are very uh, indistinct, I might stab in some uh, yellow ochre in this area to start beginning the marsh grasses that are close to us. I'm going to try to miss... That lovely shape there is just delicious, and I may, I, I, I don't like using masking fluid. This actually is probably one of the areas where I might actually try it. Uh, I don't have it with me today. I'm going to use the uh, white china marking pencil. Ah, hi, Joey. So, welcome, welcome. So, let's get into the draw here. Um Key horizontals, sort of over to this side. Ah, darn it, John. Key verticals, <laughs> mostly over here. And notice there's a lovely irregular contrasting spacing. Clumped here, a lot of them. Space open, one by itself. Um, the, uh, they're going to fall in this general vicinity. I'm just making light lines now. The more important one is the horizontal. Watch out on stuff like this. There's a curvature to this, and you don't want to fall into what I call small planet syndrome, where you draw a curve, and it looks like you're standing on an asteroid or something. Hi, Eileen. <laughs> Hi, Kathy. And the water looks as though it's going to leak out of the picture. So what I'm going to do is take advantage of the fact. Hi, Shelly. I'm going to stair step. I've spoken of this before. These areas. As I come forward and then maybe put some curvature here and put some curvature in that. And that will impute the curvature to the rest of the picture. So I realize I want that, uh, it looks like a beaver dam or maybe some kind of monkey business out there. So this, this, come down a little bit, come down a little bit more and do something like that. Uh, I've got some, these are where my trees are. I like the fact that some of them are leaning. I'm going to lean them in directions that I want perhaps maybe in towards the picture. Now, skip a space, get one about here. I'm not going to, I'm just going to do the main trunk for starters. Then I'm going to find, hi Jan, um, roughly this big wedge And this smaller wedge. And there's actually, there's a more lake further on back. So let's enjoy that too. Maybe there's something sticking up there. Now these guys, 
these marsh weeds basically are on a 45 degree angle in this vicinity. And I'm going to find what would be the water line. You can't really see too well uh, where the, some of these things hit the water and, and where, where, the object, where the weeds begin and where the uh, reflection from the weeds comes next. So I'm going to firm up some of these lines. Uh, don't want to draw these too much for the reason that when I start working wet here, uh, creamy paint into a wet surface, it's going to do a lot of moving. So it may not actually pay to uh, have that so perfectly rendered. Um, we're going to work with what we get. So there seems to be a spit of land that comes down here and then goes up into these closer trees and then there's a far group in the back. And again, I do like to paint that sort of thing more than uh, draw it and then fill it in. Um, I think I do want to take that a little bit further over so that I don't have a perfect tangent between those things. That's one of those things, if I was actually there, I would move around to get what looks like the better position. I want to maybe either cross over this or finish up the curve in here somehow so that I don't snip the painting in two. So that's about really all the drawing that I'd like to do. Now I'm going to uh, see if I can, you won't be able to see this because it's going to be white on white, but I'm going to try to uh, get some of this lovely And if it doesn't work, maybe I can come back with uh, some gouache. In fact, that probably would have been the better, the better, <laughs> we'll see. Okay, so in a thing like this, I need to get everything ready. I'm going to pick out the brushes I'm going to use. So it's pretty much going to be a three brush thing. I'm going to have a big mop to get those big washes down. I'm going to have something that's about that size and, and large again, but stiffer and carries less paint. Uh, and then I'm going to have this number 12 uh, stiff nylon one for when I want to start doing trees and things like that. So let's see. Make sure you can see all of it. There we go. Now, the washes. I need to mix up several. I need to mix up... I may also use a little nylon, I think it's a sawed off oil painting brush, possibly to do some little bit of lifting of lights in there. Get the brush wet. I'm going to need a puddle of something ochre, yellow ochre, orange. a little stronger than what I think I need because it will pale out. Just needs to be warm. And by warm, I mean in the yellow, orange, <laughs> red end of the spectrum. Hello, Kella. Hey, Carlos. So hopefully that'll be enough for that. I won't need a heck of a lot of it. I will need a lot of, uh, the table is at a roughly 45 degree angle. Uh, the palette is flat. Um, 11 by 15 cold press Saunders. 
Uh, there's definitely going to be some ultramarine blue in this. Maybe even some cerulean. These are runny mixes. I'm going to put a little bit of burnt umber into them to make them slightly grayer. Maybe a bit of a lizard or a, a lizard equivalent to get a violety subdued gray. This one I'm going to make a little more vivid. So that as I come down further to the front, and I'm going to put a little bit of cad red in that to get a sort of grayish purple. So, I have to come down here, make a bead, switch to the yellow ochre. I'm going to gauge the wetness of the paint because I want to mop out some of those... Uh, Deborah, hello, a new friend. Um, some of these uh, sky uh, bottoms of clouds there. Um, depending on how quickly it dries, uh, I need to see a little bit of water on the surface so that I can lift that out and not leave a hard line. Um, I do need to continue with that sort of color thing, but I've got a nice stopping point. I can, you know, stop here and, and, and start up again and disguise it later when the darks go in. So, uh, let's get some yellow ochre, burnt sienna, burnt umber, stiffer going off here to the side to be putting in there and maybe a little bit in there too. For the lighter portions of this, there we will be going in here with subsequent darks. So rinsing the brush out good again, blotting to get the excess water off so that I don't dilute this more than I need to. And of course now as I'm looking at it, I'm thinking, John, you need to have more paint. always pays to mix more than you think you're going to need on account of you can always add other colors to it later and make them into these colors. So here we go. I'm going to start the wash at a bit of a diagonal um, because this warm area of the sky um, is not so the, there's the bead. It's waiting for me. There's a new tree. <laughs> um, take it down a bit more. Now I'm going to rinse that. And starting with the orange, well, look at that. You shouldn't need more of that too, John. Uh, starting with the orangey stuff. That's a legitimate art term, orangey stuff. Let's make it a little redder. As we get closer to the ooh, yeah, closer to the horizon here. Um, so I'm down into where the trees are, so I don't really have to uh, worry about that getting over on it. Um, you know what? I think I want to put a little bit stronger blue in towards the top here, which is going to make it quite wet, and it's going to shear down. As long as there's water still on the surface, I can get away with this. This can come down here. If you let this go too long, and sometimes I have to tip to get the... Let's get our orangey stuff. Here we go. 
Now that looks pretty dark, I know, but it's going to pale out. And let's just keep working with the bluer stuff in here. And when I get to this point, I'm going to have to switch back to my orangey stuff to get that. There's the resist from the uh, China marker pencil. I can see I would like to have a little more orange in that. Um, getting blot that, get back into the blue. Bring this down. Now this is where I'm going to start going into this other blue, which again, I did not mix up enough paint. Putting it a little bit more vivid. There's our contrast there. Um, so coming up underneath that. Perhaps work a little more blue and a little bit more lizard into it as I come forward. I'm going to try and leave some skips. I want to start a bead here. Some little skips for these ice bits that are portions of the uh, water that are still not thawed yet. And we can always get rid of them later, right? Let's throw a little bit of brownishness into that now. Now over here, this is where I'm going to start putting in these uh, umber, ochre, oh, get some of, some of this blue to dirty it up. Let's get it more umber. Or ultramarine. Leave a few sparkles in there, it skips. Maybe we could parlay them into the lighter bits of the glass. Hey, Daniel, a new friend here, and Jeff, gosh. Hi, guys. Um, now, oh, and I was going to quit, oh, geez, Rick, quick rinse. Blot, and this still, I hope I'm, uh, get some of those, I probably waited a little too late, get some of those nice lines in the sky. You gotta keep on top of yourself. Yeah, I'm gonna get, okay, what do you do? If it looks like it's gonna be too streaky, Spritz the surface and hope for the best. Okay, okay. Hopefully I can disguise that with the trees. So lots to keep track of. <laughs> so maybe the better thing would have been to uh, just go with a not streaky sky. We'll see what we get. Uh, I think I want to switch to this brush, which holds less paint because it's stiffer hairs, so there's fewer of them, and less capillary action. A lot of ultramarine blue, maybe even some indigo, because I need to go dark. And some burn umber. And uh, this is slow moving paint. See the other one's running. This one's not moving. Let's get a little more burn umber in there. Uh, so I got that ready to go. It's 
too because I sprayed up here, it's a little too early to get into that area. Normally, I would have executed this and then gone to that because the variety of the uh, uh, wetnesses of the paper. But now I'm just going to have to be uh, in here. So try to be where I want them. Some of them are larger, some of them are smaller. Some of them are browner. That's the other thing, this will splay out. The one I'm using right now, um, I got it from Michael Solovyev, a Russian painter living in Canada, Montreal, I believe. Oh, I think it was probably around, it wasn't terribly expensive as brushes go. It was probably around uh, 20, 19, 20 bucks. And then there's a smaller one, or maybe this was like 25 and this one was like 19 or something. They last a while. An alternative, if you don't like oriental brushes, so you can see there's a lot of water where I just put paint on. Um, I'm touching in stiff paint uh, to get the darker portion of the marsh grasses. And typically, typically it will be darker at the water line because it's a little bit more waterlogged, I guess. So... I'm moving, I'm going to put more, I'm going to put some burnt sienna in it again, slow moving. I'm going to come over into this area. It's drying up a little bit here. So, uh, because it's stiff, it uh, makes a flat edge. If you can see it when I rotate it, it's a very fine line, a very wide line. So... And because the paint is stiffer, it doesn't fully saturate into the hairs. And you can do a bit of dry brushing on the run with these things. And if I, I got a very light touch. I'm kind of holding out here at the end and, you know, yanking up. Now, I want to make sure that I don't uh, space those weed lines. <laughs> sort of regularly, um, and I don't want to keep them all the same. Hue, the same position, the same thickness. You could have, uh, typically, if you make a wide line, people will say, think, oh, that must be closer to me. And a thin one, people will think, oh, that must be further away. Now, hi, Catherine. Um, However, we routinely run into situations where you've got a thin thing in the front and a wide thing in the back. So what can we do? How can we make some contrast for that? Um, make the thing further back lighter. Make it grayer. Um, that way they're not going to read the same. And I've really... Let's see if I, I, there's paint on the brush and I just blotted it. So there's very, very, very little paint in this brush. So I'm going to suggest some light things back there and some broken things here. Now the sheen is about to go off the paint here, which means that the water has soaked into, I'm going to put a bit more of the dark stuff at the bottom. Sheen has gone off this paint, so I can take my fingernail or something like this and make a line. Same here, wherever, if you see a sheen, that means there's still water on the surface and the paint will rush back in. Where there's no sheen,
the paint won't rush back in because there isn't enough water on the surface to carry it there. Now, it's probably as zippy as I want to get with this stuff. I'm dry enough up here, I think, that I can work on my um, headland. So for that, my contrast is this is smaller than that. This is darker than that. This is bluer. Well, mainly it's a value shift. There's a lot of blue, but it gets much darker here and then starts going into some of these browns and ochres again, which is kind of neat. As he goes back to fiddling over here and he shouldn't. <laughs> okay. Blue. I like a turquoise, a blue to go further away, cobalt turquoise, cerulean, the Holbein Lavender, all are nice. So these are going to be slightly slower moving paints. And then we're going to do some stuff where we create these reflections in the water by bringing some paint down and then putting a little bit of water underneath it, not smearing it physically, but we're going to put a little bit of water underneath it so that the paint can swim down in there and create a sort of, uh, hopefully, I hope, I hope, I hope, wintry looking reflection. Now, it's a little bit of irregularity in it, but as I go left, I'm going to put a little bit more of the darker components in there. If you can kind of go sideways, you might get a more broken kind of stroke. I'm going to stop about there. I'm not going to come all the way down because I'm going to put a little more brown in that. Although I might go out here to our little beaver dam, or whatever the heck it was, thing there. So, uh, more cerulean. Oh, let's get some lizard in there. Lizard and cerulean. Makes a murky, distant looking dark. Now notice I'm not going up to the tall trees just yet. Let's even throw in some Prussian and some Cad Red for make a rich purpley. So adding a little more color as I come closer to me. So there's some contrast. Uh, hopefully I'm going to get the appearance of something closer to me. Into the brown, murky, well, let's get umber, sienna, maybe even a little bit of yellow ochre. Just let them kiss. And possibly, well, I'm not going to leave too many skips back there. There wouldn't be that many. But I want to make sure that the paint is nice and wet at its, at its bottom edge here. Remember, keep those lines level. We want to see level lines with water. Uh, or the human eye wants to see that. Now I'm going to slip a little bit of yellow ochre into that dirt to suggest, I hope, that where the light is back there, it's, it's illuminating those marsh grasses a bit more than the ones up here. Now, so look how light this has dried. We're going to go back into that again. Now, beneath these colors here, 
Let's get some of that lavender. A load of good. I'm going to get some runny version of those colors and put it below it. And then I'm going to take a little bit of water and just come up and again kiss it to get the look of a reflection. And I might even tease down where there's going to be a tall item. Be careful with your spacing on those things. Uh, if you make something, you're going to have to have an object for, for a reflection. <laughs> so uh, I'm getting a bit of a blob there. So I'm just, I rinsed the brush, squeezed it out. And I'm just kind of evacuating that so that that reflection is nice and soft. Reflections are a little darker in here because the objects are a little darker. So I'm going to have to mix some more of that. Ultramarine. Burn Umber. More Burn Umber. More Ultramarine. Oh, let's try some Burnt Sienna. It'll go greenish. There we go. Well, not quite. Edge. Let's try Cerulean. There we go. That's what I'm looking for. Blot the brush slightly, coming in for the reflections of these trees up here. And these are definitely going to have to go dark with those foreground leaves there. It's going to disappear into them. I might mix a slower moving mix of uh, the darker blues, maybe some of the umber, and tip in. That looks the color I need for the reflection where it's light, but what I need is the color for the reflection where it's dark, right next to the, the water line. Uh, So below this one, since I'm not reflecting a tree, I'm just reflecting some uh, marshy grass. I'm just kissing, bringing some water underneath to get the marshy look. I could, at this point, get some of this bluish, nondescript stuff. And it's going to look like a mess for a while. We have to get used to that. Uh, and start, yeah, suggesting the vertical portions of my trees. I try to remind myself to paint them from the bottom up. The way they grow. That way the top tends to be a little thinner. So that means I'm going to have to slip some reflection in there. And for safety's sake, at this point, I think I'm going to draw it. Dry it. <laughs> so cover your ears. We're at the holy mess stage. We're going to start fixing it up.
Okay, enough of that noise. Now, I'm going to be working primarily with these two brushes. Um, uh, I like the very paleness of this. This needs to come a wee bit darker. So, either cerulean or ultramarine. Bit of cad red. Glazing now, really. Um, I'm going to start over here and work my way, uh, start dark and work my way light. Put a little more red and umber into that. Some alizarin. I may go to the Prussian because it's dark, 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 dark to begin with. to those trees, but not redo them yet. Now I'm going to rinse that, maybe put a little lavender in it as I work right and further away. Okay, so more in the brown tone areas. Leaving some of that first pass color behind to be the lighter portions of that area. This will hopefully be the Final pass color of it. Hmm. Get, put a little bit of water beneath that spot to get a reflection for whatever that is that's happening back there. I'm going to Prussian, maybe some yellow ochre for a yellow ochre and burnt sienna for a greenish brownish mix. I'm going to deepen the reflections here. Again, leaving bits of the previous color behind. That's a level of contrast too. I want to not have, I want to have flat areas of color and I want to have modeled areas of color. Again, where the reflection needs to be softened, I just bring a little bit of water underneath it. Or a lot of water underneath it. <laughs> Now don't make your reflections in the back as prominent as your reflections in the foreground. I am actually, I should say, I should admit I'm actually touching the paint here. I'm not bringing so much the, uh, I'm pulling down to get a kind of a, 
striated look, which I see more of that here, not so much back there. But there are places where I do need to just tease it with the water. Hello, Patty. That's okay, while that's working by itself, I am going to begin doing some additions to this area in here. Sort of a glaze of yellow ochre, but again, leaving some of the previous color behind. Uh, darker stuff now. Uh, so for that I'll want the indigo or Prussian and some burnt sienna. Maybe more of the Prussian. Very, very dark. Uh, but ooh. What happened if I Sprayed that. So the surface is ever so slightly wet. I'm hoping, yeah, there we go. These edges will kind of bleed out a bit. They've got some water to swim into. Again, I'm trying to be careful not to equally space these marks. It's just human. I want to do that. Uh, that means I'm going to have to Blot the paint off the brush and irregularize some of this. Um, well, that's working on its own. But I do want a bit of a weedy stuff here to kind of make a Z back to all that. Now, these things, very bluish, but dark. So my blues, ultramarine, Prussian. That's a slow moving paint. And the brush is not fully loaded, it's kind of stiff, so I'm going to try and I'm laying the brush on its side and stroking the paper like that. And I'm trying to make it dark est at what I am going to say is the water line, where it's most waterlogged. I'm going to bring up some connectors. down here. Look at that, I'm evenly spacing them again. Dog got it. It's just human nature. Now where this dark edge is wet, rinse, Lot, bring a little bit of water up underneath. Maybe even a, even a, for this, because it's closer to us, some loose, runny version of the same color.
dampening the paper beneath it, hopefully getting some of that. I think it's And if you do need to stop, well, down here, and maybe the thing that I loved about this, this image the most was this ice. Um, so that means there's going to be a kind of a darker, more purpley green, green, irregular shaped patches. With a relatively uh, geometric kind of shape. And I'll show you how I'm going to try and make those look like places where ice has cracked and moved a bit, but that's going to be one of the more final marks. I'm going to have a very purplish, oops, too purple. Purplish bit to the front. Now let's get into our trees and our um, kind of marks that sort of define stuff. Small brush, number 12, pretty good point. I'm going to get some of that and again, like that other brush, because it's stiffer hair, when you push it along its side, it makes a, a more broken stroke. So I should get some of that. And It's some sort of fur or evergreen. I need a bluish, grayish, greenish, who knows what. The shapes, these irregular shapes are going to be larger and more irregular and first spaced further apart towards the bottom of the tree in question and closer together and smaller and thinner as they go up. Another form of contrast. Shoot, I need to be more bluish, I think. Bluish purplish. Or maybe not, a little brown in there. That area, we're gonna, it's going to get some work too. Some of these trees I'm going to pull down in front of us. Some I'm going to leave behind. Perhaps make one of them a little darker than the other so that the one that's lighter will appear further away. Uh, or change their color up a bit, you know, with a little more brownishness in one. Very blue. Uh, 
towards the bases or between the trunks maybe indicate hopefully some of this deeper shade back here. If it looks as though I've gotten carried away with that, then I can always smear it or blot it. Now the water line on the marsh grass there And darken that up a bit in places and it should get wider as it comes further to the left being closer to us. I'm going to take advantage of the sheen here to pull something out like that. Perhaps maybe make a lighter trunk there. Go back here and get my, I keep calling it a beaver dam, but it's, it's not damming anything, is it? Might be a muskrat. Don't know if they have those there. Now let's get in here and do some of this business. I don't want to get too detailed back here because then I'll have to go crazy up here. So, direction that it grows, irregularly, unevenly spaced. Possibly making nice connectors to what's behind them. As soon as something comes from the foreground and overlaps something in the background, then we get an automatic uh, idea that it has to be in front. So here it's dark, but here I'm going to make it light. Same here. Then if I've got dark, prominent weeds and things coming up here, then I have to make them plausible <laughs> down here. So I have to continue them. And that's why I darkened this up so that I could lose these in there. Hello, Kay. Thank you. Now... I do want to lean them maybe towards that, but I don't want to lean them all in the same direction. That would be some seed heads maybe. You notice as, as the brush exhausts, I can make a thinner line and those are the ones that I'm sending out to the back or further back in space. There are other ways to do this if you get there too late. So if you get there a little bit late, it's not a criminal offense. Browner. Let's get a browner mix. Let's even do a bit of splattering there. Aim the bird. Don't go like this. You'll get birds.
Then you can smear them and maybe turn them into leaves or grasses. Some irregular shapes. It's something a little more bluish. Lot the brush and I want to get a bit more irregularity. in that. It, well, there's a little clumpy, another thing I, I was, it looked like a bird's nest. Maybe a red-winged blackbird or something. Pull that sideways. I wanted to have a few individual grasses sticking up. Now, the let's get a just a blue, a darkish blue. And on the four edges, try to make these ice pieces look as though they're cracked and, and coming away from each other. And yeah, okay. Blue back in there. Can smear it up. Um, Jane, hello. Got several of the Saturday Sketch crew here today. I'm going to splatter a little bit of blue down here as well. and smear. And then I'm going to just maybe take a little bit of that and make a more, um, the grasses growing up should be a little thicker their side than over here. So the line here should be thinner than the line at the water over here. Um, where else can we go? Lavender. Love lavender. Jeez. Put a little bit of that there. A little bit there. Oh, heck. Just on this side, oops. Just on the right side, as it's going to the left, I want it to, us to go around like that. Um, I might look for some odd spacing to, oops. My friend Andrea is sending me interesting things. Okay, let's get into Oh, another thing I'd like to do with that is uh, again with the lavender or the turquoise is the uh, zigzag ice flow out here. And now that I look at it, the better way to have done that, really, in the end, would have been either with the uh, 
use the dreaded masking fluid, which I don't like, but um, that would be a good place for it. Or white gouache. And here's another fun thing you can do. You can get a stiff brush like this. Make sure it's clean, 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 clean water. And you can make little lifts in here. Oops, dirty water. Um, you can even do it in, in this stuff. You can make a lighter... You could go back into, let's say you wanted to have a straighter line back here. And it also, if you block that, you'll get even more off. Because most of the colors I've been using are liftable, ultramarine. Uh, that might have been another way to do that. Um, ultramarine, yellow, ochre, burnt sienna, these are all very nicely liftable colors. I could reconfigure the shapes of my ice. Gosh, yeah, I could recover a light spot. Through there in the water or here. Yeah, I could make a light trunk. Let's So, and you almost don't need to get any uh, gouache out, do we? I'm going to loosen up the paint on the white china marker and blot it off. Because it's a waxy substance, so it's just sitting on top. Yeah, that works. So contrast. That's the big issue today. Contrast. Contrast of value. Contrast of... Uh, Size, contrast of position, contrast of texture, contrast of value, hue. Um, not much hues here. I mean, pretty much blues and ochres and, and, and browns. Uh, contrast of, of, of uh, areas of density and areas of, of open kind of stuff. I'm going to slip in some more. Stuff here closer to us. Some plausibility issues with the stems in the front. Let's detape and see what we're getting. That might tell us. But maybe the two biggest things to do with the contrast is make sure that you have contrast in your contrast. Don't have too many of the same type, size, color, value um, of a particular shape. You want to make sure that there's some variety to create the sense of space. And then talk yourself through what the contrasts or the difference are. Yeah, um, there are some pinks in there. Um, I did try to smuggle in a little bit of... Uh, uh, oh, you're welcome, uh, Kathy. Um, as I'm looking... Yeah, as I'm looking at it on my monitor, my gosh, there's a lot of purple in here. <laughs> 
Whereas um, on the pad, it's nowhere near that purple. There's a tiny bit of it, but not a heck of a lot. Um, it'd be nice to maybe when it's bone dry, glaze a bit of that right down here. You know, start with water here and then come in with the... Uh, with the alizarin or the pink or something. Um, what would I change? What would I change? I think I need, I think I, what I think I need is this needs to have a more plausible reflection. So I'm putting water beneath it. And now I'm going to put in Touch into that. Yeah, I think that's more believable now. Couldn't see that before. Okay, so where the, the it's starting to get hard there, I'm going to tease it out by coming right under it and getting the water and moving that. So I guess I'm going to need that here too, aren't I? But I'll make this a little browner. Just for some difference. And I suppose this shape needs to be more irregularized. or I need to make an analog for it. Remember on your reflections, if it's leaning this way in the reflection, it's leaning that way in the, uh, where it's actually at. And I do want a couple of connectors that go up here. That might be the one place that I put in a little bit of uh, paint some light. I'll get too many of those. Get busy. Or maybe even splatter it. Okay, okay, that's that. So, look for the contrasts. Plan out how you're going to do them. Um, T-Mobile, everybody's at me today. Um, mix up your washes. Have them ready to go. Pick out the brushes you're going to use. Have them ready to go. You don't want to be fishing around for stuff while... Well, Things are drying up and you have a situation like I did with with the stripes in the sky. I think I just got away with that. But um, hopefully the just the, the idea of contrast uh, being a, our biggest tool in our art vocabulary, uh, hopefully that came across and uh, something that you can and, and it will it's useful in every medium, but in watercolor, it's almost doubly important. So uh, thank you all for tuning in. Uh, it looks like we're going to have a nice, relatively warm week. Uh, so everybody stay safe, stay sane, and I'll see you next Wednesday. Bye-bye.